you. I call the meeting to order with everyone present. First item on the agenda, Amanda Webb from Hacker Nelson and Company with the uh, 23 financial report. But first I need to talk about how the microphones are working for those of you online. If you are wanting to say anything, it's not a public hearing, but if, if Dan as the chair chooses to have you speak online, I need to mute a button first so that we mute the room so we can hear you and you don't have feedback on your end. So that is a thing we need to do today in case that happens. Thank you. And it's all yours. Great. Um, I think you all received copies electronically as far as yeah. board members. Um, one thing I'm going to go over first quick is this. There's like a three page letter that's directed to the board of supervisors and it's kind of we call it a communication letter because it has certain things we're supposed to communicate to you as the board. A few of the items. First thing is talking about estimates. Obviously within the financial statements, there's estimates. Biggest ones are listed there. It would be useful life of assets, you know, infrastructure. Depreciate those out over what we consider the useful life. Um, the other one is related to the IPERS and OPEB liability, which we get actuarial reports and use those numbers from there. Um, and then we do, we book um, a lease receivable and new this year is an IT subscription liability. We do a present value kind of calculation over the lease term. So those are some pretty big estimates that can change from year to year. Man, I can interrupt you right there. Ben Steinis, County Auditor, right there. Hey. Hey. Don't get that every week. That's yeah. right. You want to pass it off? Yeah. <clears throat> Save that out next time. Um, a few of the other things we're supposed to communicate to you, corrected and uncorrected misstatements, we didn't have any of those. Most of our journal entries we propose are full journal entries, um, fix that, take like that, that type of thing. Um, there were no disagreements with management and everybody signed the representation letter saying they were honest with us. And um, the other one is management con consultation with other auditors and that's kind of opinion shopping we call it. If they don't like our answer, they would go to a different firm and we're not aware of that. That firm is supposed to notify us. That has not happened. Those are just things we're required to communicate to you. Um, getting to this year's financial statements. Page two is our audit opinion and we had an unmodified or clean opinion where everything is correct with materiality within our materiality. Um, page five through 5G, we call this our management discussion and analysis. It's not the paper copy, it's all electronic. Yeah, it's really cool so mm -hmm. I don't know if you wanted to know. To. If you don't read the whole thing, it's like an 80 some page audit report, the whole thing. Five through five G, I believe, was a good summary the whole year. And then if you look at 5D, 5C and 5D have comparisons from last year. Um, one of the things you'll see this year, some of the big variations are related to ARPA funding. Um, so a lot of that was received in 21 and 22, and that continues to kind of throw some of the analyticals off a little bit just because of when you receive it and when you spend it. Um, so that was kind of a big reason for some of the decreases. Overall, revenues of the governmental funds decreased about 27%. Um, and a bulk of that is the ARPA funds. Um, let's see, and we'll flip back to... The other thing I want to point out is note 19 on page 52. We did have a restatement this year um, for a couple different reasons. One, the, the way the ARPA funds were handled in previously, it was considered revenue, 
Now we've moved it. And if you haven't spent it, it's gone from, we've taken it out of fund balance basically and put it on the balance sheet as an honored revenue because it hasn't been spent yet. So that was one of the restatements. Um, the other one is related to um, sharing activities we call them custodial funds. So previously, you know, that's kind of an in and an out. So we would consider that a due to other funds. Now they're putting it in as like a, a restricted fund balance position. So it just, that flipped. It went from a balance sheet item to fund balance. So it's kind of just classification things. Um, and the other thing with that note, it discloses um, IT subscription liability, which is new. Last year was the leases. We had to book an asset and the liability for it. Now they've looked at IT subscriptions that are longer than one year. And we have to book that as a liability. Um, that's a GASB statement. We're required to do that. So that note kind of talks about those items that are kind of the bigger changes for this year. It's a liability because you have a contractual agreement. Right. Yep. Similarly, going after this year, we'll have the purchase of the new building in my contractual agreement for right. okay. we're putting that on it'll show up next year at this yeah. time <laughs> so it's similar to leases in that you look at the term of it the payments you use a discount rate you kind of back that present value and you book the liability and then as you make those payments instead of having that expense it reduces the liability um Another page I like to show is page 67. And I like this one because it's schedule nine. You're on page number seven. 68. And this shows a 10 year history of revenue and expenses for the governmental funds. Um, so I just like to point that out to boards. They can see kind of some of the trends, obviously, uh, federal dollars or road projects, you know, bigger projects from year to year. Those are two things that can vary. But a lot of times things, other things are pretty consistent. And then this year we did perform a single audit since you spent more than 750,000 in federal dollars. Um, we had to do what we call a single audit, which has been common for Winnership County, maybe not so much for other counties. Um, this year, a lot of them fell into it because of ARPA funds, but you guys have typically had one. And when, I ask, when I ask, when we start a project, it, I almost always ask, do you usually have to file a single audit? I almost, I just always say yes, because it is yeah. almost every year. <laughs> I, yeah, I can't remember the last year that you guys have had one. $750,000 of federal money is, is not a high threshold. Um, and with that, we look at we look at all the federal dollars spent, and we have to designate major programs, non-major programs based on what was spent, and then determine what we're going to test. And this year it was the ARPA funds, um, and then we're required to do compliance testing and make sure those dollars were spent according to the rules of their rules. And those programs change from year to year what we test um, based on how much they spend, kind of. Questions? And with that, there were no issues. Um, in the back, starting on page 81, is our management letter. And this has items. Um, so we have governmental standards. We have the single audit standards that we audit with. But then the state auditor also has compliance, specific compliance things we're supposed to test. And we list those in the management letter. Those are 1 through 10. And we have to report on those whether we found anything or not. Um, and of those items, the, the compliance issues that we're supposed to test, we had no issues on any of those. 
Um, we do have one finding that has been here probably since it started is with the capital asset records. They continue to work to keep those up to date. But that is a big, um, we spend a lot of audit time kind of making sure those are accurate. And the software isn't the greatest at tracking them. Um, so. We also have some graphs in there that show five-year trends. Um, since most of you don't have them in front of you, I don't know that I'm gonna go through them one by one. Except for maybe this one, just for your reference, this is governmental fund revenue. Um, the blue is property taxes, the red is intergovernmental. The green is local option sales tax and the purple is other. And I just, I guess when I look at this, you can see like it's not changing much. Yeah, consistent. And, and you know all the costs are rising. So I just, that was something that kind of jumped out to me in a picture. What year is that taller one? This is 2022 and in this purple would be our products. Yeah. So short to them. Everything else yeah. is pretty flat. Right. Yeah. So as I was reviewing those, that was something that jumped out to me. Otherwise, there is um, revenue analysis. I guess I can show these. Blue is property taxes, which is 47%. And then the red is intergovernmental, which is about 38% of your revenue. What would that include? Um, federal and state yeah. dollars, Primarily fruit, anything yeah. you get from a government, basically. Now, road would road money would make up the biggest chunk of that. Yeah, right? road use tax would be in there. Yeah. Um, and then expense analysis. The purple is roads and transportation. The green, this light green over here is county environment, and then the blue is public safety. So those are kind of the biggest. This so administration is the one of the top three we're in here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and I would say if you're reviewing things on your own time and you have questions, Concerns, feel free to reach out to me through the office. Ben has my email. I like the graph, so we'll have to tell you that one as well. Okay. Big, just a of a lot of black and white. Where everything is okay. at. And if there's any sort of graph you would like to see going forward, you know, we can sure try and put that together. Mm -hmm. okay. You've got 80 pages to print all together. That's when when you look at the graph, it just kind of summarizes the data at the end for a lot of it. That's why the MDNA up at the front, it's about four or five pages, that five through five G, just a good summary of everything else. Um, and the graphs help too. So we need to get some different software for yeah, I mean, I was picking up on it too. Yeah, the yeah, and so the, what's the problem, recommend. The problem is that mostly departments handle their own inventory records and so we don't have a central location to just report it right so everything that the roads shops whether it's parts or equipment or everything they're handling in their software so when they want us a report of it we got to work through collect these things from all the different departments to get yeah and that's kind of what we do because they have you yeah. know what they know but we pull all the pieces yeah. kind of together is that uncommon from other counties um not necessarily um if there's probably a, probably a couple that are similar to Winnipeg county and maybe a couple that are able to do it all on their own of what we audit um and a lot of the other governments cities they don't necessarily unless they're accrual basis they're allowed to be cash basis so they don't have to so city should be cash basis but 
counties are accrual. Mm -hmm. It is continues to be a cruel basis and yeah. a few they, do. They, I mean, the example is you buy a new maintainer. The city could just put that in as an expense for that year, whereas we've got to book it and figure out its usable life and, you know, depreciate it as the time goes by and so on versus. We try to, we try to do a lot of that in when we're entering claims or by noting the account numbers because we try to use account numbers with optic codes that start with six as items that are big enough to go into our inventory but you know if people buy a laptop and they put a 600 code on it then it isn't big enough to actually go in there but it was an equipment purchase for them so it gets mm -hmm. it hard so we're, it's hard to distinguish them this wasn't a big enough expense to actually get in our inventory versus this was. And so that's what they have been going through is this whole mess of. So do we have a, a magic number that is we try to apply as a, a basis? 500, 5,000, 50, We look at 5, this person's over 5,000. And it's only, if you, in the financial statements, it's only for exhibit A and B, which is the full cruel Gatsby statements that are required. Um, Exhibits C and back are more how you operate on a day to day. So it's just for those front statements for gas for purposes, which is the governmental accounting standings. Is that a number that we could give to the department of so when they're running on the approval? And we try to do that, but. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't know that it's it's even because uh, we get like reports that roads uses they have kind of a separate system to track infrastructure and that type of thing. So you could get most of it for the county, but I think you're always going to have to pull in that roads piece separately. It might, it might get to be a bigger hassle trying to put everybody in the one system. Yeah. That's not used to. That's what we've kind of decided. <laughs> <laughs> we try to keep. The, the, the uh, department's helping us as much as we can, but I think that <laughs> note is going to show up on the, like she said, it's always been there and it'll probably always be there. Spreadsheet of formulas. I mean, that's what they do for us, basically. I mean, well, good to be the one came up. We probably still gonna have to go back through it. Right? But we could, but then that's just a separate set of accounting records that they have to maintain. I mean, the system gets most of it. I think that's part of what it is to double check, anyways, to make sure nothing was missed. And I think some of it is the way that it calculates depreciation. I think some of I've seen a few where it allows it to go negative for whatever reason the software does. So. So it's not broke. It's just a line item in the annual report. Yeah. I think we leave it alone. I'll piggyback on the managed report. I we put together this more uh, reduced uh, public friendly friendly report. So I'll put some copies over here. To, it's just. Thank you. It isn't a full accounting report, but it is a report if people are interested in some of the county finances. So if you want to look through that, that's the primary. Do you want to have anything else for Amanda or you got anything else for us? <clears throat> I would just like to thank the staff, Ben and his audit staff, and really a lot of the employees in the offices. We we get about every department, so they always make us a priority so we can get in and get out. Sounds good. Good. Thank you. A lot. Thank you. We usually do a motion to like accept the audit and report. Do we uh, accept the audit? Second. We have a motion and a second to be to accept the audit and the report. Uh, any further discussion? If none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign.
Nancy carries unanimously. So a big thank you to Hacker Nelson. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you. And I'll echo yeah. your thanks to our employees. They're awesome. Yeah. I'm glad. These, these are yours. Yep. These are your copies. Thank you. I'll leave one here to Jason. <laughs> and I'll put one in our current record. Thank you guys. Thank you. Nope. Thanks, Amanda. Well, I'm going to mute our mic here, Michael, during your presentation. Mm -hmm. And then if anybody here wants to say something or have a question from Michael, let me know because then I need to hit the button again. So. Okay. Next on the agenda, Michael Cuny, County Engineer, discuss department work schedule and other road project updates. Go ahead, Mike. Okay, I'll start out with my generic report. Um, did some more uh, boundary research for the survey I did last week on Happy Hollow Road. Um, brush clearing uh, and DNR coordination for Bridge 126 uh, for a 2026 project has begun. Permitting for fiber optic lines, the Accentech is finished. Uh, a couple other ones have um, right of way issues, such as the Ho Happy Hollow Road. Um, received applications for uh, bridge crew and summer positions. So I think we have, two, last I checked, we had two bridge crew applicants, I think. Uh, same invoice is ongoing. Um, we're reaching out to the Army Corps of Engineers uh, for Bridge 208E. Um, I started uh, a precursor to an, a bridge inspection class. I have to get a, a class before a class. So I started that this weekend. Um, continuing the NACO leadership training uh, GIS, we're working with the GIS department for various things and expanding uh, what it is we're mapping. Uh, and then, yes, we are constantly talking about budget in our office. So that's the generic report. Um, I was told the, the agenda has for me to discuss uh, road projects. Um, we are going four tens uh, this this summer, and we will start with W14, uh, shouldering that uh, and and making it so that uh, it it is supported when we construct that later this 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 year. Final plans for W14 were put in uh, for the Fort uh, Atkinson to Spillville portion. Was it last week or the week before? Um, so we are just working with the we are working with the state on that. Uh, then we have two uh, called two bridges uh, that we are going to let locally. Bridge three thirteen and bridge three seventeen A have been worked on. I. Um, have Bridge 317A's plans on my desk that have not been reviewed yet, but I will be uh, reviewing those and working with the staff to get those let. And those projects, both of those projects, we would expect to uh, be completed this year. Um, bridge 5. Uh, is, I think the letting is still scheduled for, I can't remember if it's April or May, um, but that's a bridge over the Yellow River in the southeast portion of the county. And that will be, um, that will be a project most likely done this year as well. And that is all I can think of for, for, projects that are going to happen 
Well, I guess there's a Frankville, the Frankville, we're gonna be working on Frankville uh, pipe projects, getting the culverts put in for, for the following year's uh, pavement project. Uh, any other, if there's any other questions, I'm willing to take them now. A couple of things, Michael. One, the contract for Spillville water was let last week. Uh, so that will be moving forward. Don't have any dates yet, but the contract for the pumping and storage was for, was let to uh, JB Holland. And then the other portion of the contract uh, was let, I think, to Sumner uh, from Southern for the road work portion of it in concrete. Uh, a lot of that will be sublet to Skyline for a lot of the, con most of the concrete work. So all of that is proceeding. Uh, number two, I'd like to thank you and your staff for all of this, which is duplicating the plans that we were able to secure on the Spectrum building. They were kind enough to duplicate these. So we have copies for, for the uh, space planning, et cetera. And then a minor thing with a question on, on your expenditures, there was a about a $5,000 expenditure on herbicide. And I just, as a reminder, I know there was a, when we happened to view that building last year, that there was a whole, there was quite a bit of unused herbicides in that building. And that, that may be worth checking into see there's a lot of, of uh, Roundup and a bunch of other chemicals that were still in that. And before they age out, I'm hoping that they will have been used. Uh, I don't know, I won't say I don't know anything about it. I did see the, the line item. I haven't done, uh, it's not under my, it is now under my attention that I will look into it. Okay, is there anything um, regarding the, the projects portion? Still on line for <clears throat> August, September for the W14 project then? Yes. Yes. Okay. We'll still need to have a discussion when Michael is here about funding that because he's going to need to have money in June for the new fiscal year to put into our farm to market account so that we can proceed with that project. So he's still working on the exact dollar amount and then we'll have to figure out where you're going to come up with it. Yeah, I think we we can have that uh, discussion. I think we're sitting pretty good. Are we were sitting pretty good before this weekend on my projected balance? Um, as far as how we want to fund that farm to market, that's a you and I discussion, uh, Ben. So I'm uh, more than happy to have that discussion whenever you're ready. Well, Mike, I don't think we have anything else for you, so we will let you go. Thank you. Um, uh, just, just real quickly, I was kind of listening in on the uh, Amanda Webb discussion, and there was a whole bunch of things that I'm not aware of there, um, but I just want her to know if there's something that we can do and inter to help her out and make things, um, make the books work more completely. I'm more than happy to work with her on that. Yeah, thank you for that. I'm sure she will appreciate it. Have a good day. All right, thank All right, you. Thank you. All right, what do we have for consent agenda? I have the minutes, the claims, and the VA monthly report. I move to approve the consent agenda. Second that. We have a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda. Is there any further discussion? If none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion carries unanimously.
And this report that I handed out earlier, this one is on our website, so you can see it there. And also I'll put the, once we get the audit from Hacker Nelson in PDF form, I'll put that on the website also so people can read through it at their leisure. Okay. Uh, committee reports. I see we got a email conservation thanking the farmers and uh, pretty much the Lake Meyer. I don't think be a really watershed program, but in the area to make Lake Meyer clean water area. So if it wasn't for the farmers, it would have never happened. So I just want to thank you to all the farmers out in that area. Yeah, we got the news off the. Uh, Oh, what list is that? Oh, in our web when this was called. Yeah, yeah, it was the bad water list in the plane. Yeah, it was the, I mean, I, if you look at the list of all of the agencies involved, there would be federal, state, in private, or even our county agencies, soil, water conservation, and our conservation for being part of that too. So it's a great group effort. And it's amazing that it has been reversed. <laughs> There's only 700 and some endangered ones to go yet now. <laughs> For the record, it was the EPA's impaired waters list. Yeah. Uh, the, do you want to mention the sign at uh, the oh, yeah, community that. services building? Um, John, there was an email. John Halverson had some mock-ups that uh, Letterworks had for the signage down there. Mm -hmm. I kind of like the blue ones better than I did, the, I did the all white cool. ones. I don't have a preference. My my comment on was the 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 one that I was Winnishie County Community Services. I'd like to see the two line one, but I'd like to see the Winnishie County a little bit larger so that it's identified as the county building and not a city building from a confusion standpoint. I forwarded it off to Mike Clemish, who owns graphics to see if he had a comment. I hadn't heard back from him to see if he could if he had some suggestion as another eye on it. It's the two line one, the blue two line one, the top, the top one, top uh, one, yeah. top one. Only make Winnipeg County a little bigger. Make the Winnipeg County bigger. Just probably alter or switch the two lines around. Might be. It's. Well, I think we want to make sure we don't have a confusion between city and county on that. I definitely like the blue ones. I think. Yeah. I think the white on the blue stands out a lot better. Yep. Yeah, I like. I did like the one with two lines on it. But even going to uh, and blue, obviously. Um, I think when you start putting the, just looking at our logo, the one that Brent has on the front, the one that the county got the yeah. road department. We don't have a unified logo for the county, so putting that ninety six on there. A little I agree with you, Mark. I think simple is best. It makes it look like a secondary roads department. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's clever. But I think you it's want to go I would say that top right one to move the. Yeah. You want to have one of you be coordinate with John Halverson just to get it ordered once you get it. We can, I can yeah. do that. I talk to John every call. That sounds like well, everyone is, is basically on the same track. So. Because I thought when you started getting into county services separately and it's, it's quite yeah, I'll try to get something back for next week so we all see it and decide on it. That'd be great. Yeah, yeah it's all still thanks to you for getting that done. Um I have a uh with respect to that building uh, this is we were very fortunate one of the a side benefit of going down to Des Moines for the uh, ISAC meetings was that what are the chances? Martin Gardner was there, the architect that did all of our courthouse work. Martin Gardner also designed the Spectrum building. And I was talking with them and mentioned this. And they said, oh, I think we designed that. And in fact, and one thing led to another and they dug in their archives and found the plans for us and sent us electronic copies of the floor plans so that we have that for space planning, which is is huge. Oh, the amount of time we had already talked tentatively with the engineering department to try to come up with rough drawings and would they, but boy, this was a gift. 
They're so nice, They're so nice to have. One other thing on the courthouse, uh, we're, remember, we'll be starting the evenings this week, I believe, a lot of the floor stripping issue for the, uh, the second floor area to be able to put in the final uh, pour on next week, this coming weekend. Uh, John's a little concerned because we have we need to have John Lukey move out of that office into the space over here in the in the old jail building. Uh, we've had conversations about that space being used in the future for HR or for small conference room. So we but we need to be able to. There's so much equipment and things in there. We need to have think, it moved out. And I when I talked to John last week, he was of the opinion that he'd rather have that room be carpeted than have it put the new flooring down like the room across the you know, old little conference room next to my office okay. had the same floor as what his the new office does and he wondered if it would be better to put carpeting in there just from a sound perspective because it gets kind of echoey in there yeah, so a lot so it'd be a, yeah so it, it, you know. it would i think it would be disappointing to have him move everything out, pay to have that floor stripped and sealed and then put carpeting over it later. So we should make sure we determine if that's really what we want to do. It is a different type of floor in, in that room than in the hallway and the, and the treasures, auditors, uh, recorders. And so that that's a different type of flooring than in that room. Yeah. So it would be a okay place to stop. It isn't like we'd stop at that the middle of that same mm -hmm. floor that goes into those other offices, it would be just that that wooden chain. I think that's probably a good idea. Although we do need to move towards creating that space as, I mean, we've all, I think we all recognize we have a, a significant need for, a, for an HR person in there functioning. And if that's the case, we might, you know, sooner than later, we, we need to have John go ahead and move to the space we've created for him over here. I think uh, he he was hoping at least to leave Fatima in there as long as until you need the space because she's running around the courthouse so much that it would be easier for her to respond from being in the building and so on. But yeah, that's a, that's true. Except yeah. one of the things that much of the courthouse staff likes to do is it makes it very easy for them to call on her yeah. rather than put a ticket in to yeah. do the way we were set up to do it yeah. and supposed to so many of the things that she does are very insignificant she's very gracious in doing them mm -hmm. but we're also i don't know that that's highest and best use for her talents mm -hmm. i agree there are people yeah. that know when they can find her in person that they can get it done right away even if it isn't the highest priority so yeah. and that's that's putting out constantly putting out fires mm -hmm. So oh, we did have one other report from the buildings and grounds issue. We have a brand new roof on top of us right here. They were able to finish that last week with the new EDPM roof and all of that stuff. If you notice on the outside, the, the outside borders that were <coughs> poor looking wood <coughs> exposed are exposed are now covered and so forth. That's very nicely done. Um, and perhaps as early as this week or next, we may be beginning on replacement of the roof over on the old jail next yeah. door. So those issues are getting addressed, which is we're fortunate that we have not had leaks up there that were not that we know of in the old jail. Another uh, ground or buildings issue just on your radar, not like this month or next month, but maybe in the next year, is our elevator is so old that they are having trouble getting parts when it breaks down and so john Halverson actually has a bid for a replacement of the elevator and we're it's like a hundred and twenty thousand dollars so we did not include that in the budget yeah well he's got i think about three hundred thousand or two hundred fifty or three hundred thousand for all of the maintenance, maintenance. so that's going to take up the biggest chunk of if he has to do that next year, fiscal year. But it might be, I mean, we'll get the roof done here. That might be where we have to put the next big project is that elevator. We still have lingering issues on the main courthouse roof that are still yet unresolved. Martin Gardner is continuing to press on that so we can get everything 
completely, then there is a, an issue on what's called a pull test on those the shingles on the roof up there that has to be done. And of course, they're waiting for better weather to do that. Uh, that may be scheduled relatively soon. There's still dispute over uh, roofing materials and the roof leaks that are not necessarily resolved. There is an issue on, on the, what's called a termination bar that goes around the, the stone portion of the top roof. That is uh, the discussions of that being a possible source of the leak. I really don't see that being the case. And I'm really going to be very questioning on whether or not an expenditure like that is authorized, but I don't think that's the issue. I had a conversation with Martin Gardner's architects down there at the uh, Des Moines meeting about my my questioning. We have a, a lower level uh, ventilation mechanism that's just about four to six feet up from the lower level that is allows air to come in and then go out the top to to ventilate that roof space. And it's also seems to be where we have thermal camera imaging that shows water below that area, which may possibly be, and that's still to be determined. I've had that discussion with Martin Gardner about it to see if we can finally come to the point. Uh, we may do some more thermal imaging up there to see if, when we have a little warmer weather to find out if we still see the presence of water in the thermal image. That's yet to be done. Uh, we do know there's one area of relief leaking up there that we occasionally had a leak show up in a valley on this side. But even to the point where, where uh, Bethany crawled up in there on her own into an area to go look at it specifically, I couldn't have even fit in there. I don't know how she did, but she did that. I mean, they're really working for us. Have you looked at it today with the same moisture? I haven't been up there today, but I, that's a good point. I'll take and take John or Tony and we'll go upstairs and see what we can find. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can you have something, Mark? Um, tomorrow, the representatives from the judicial district are coming through. They're here and going then going to uh, Allegheny County afterwards. So meet with me and I've also invited uh, Sheriff Marks to he would have a better knowledge of the needs that we have and how we're doing with that. That's tomorrow. Um, County Social Service is moving on Wednesday. Okay. And how's that all not moving? We have, we're hosting the County Social Services in May. Um, so I've reserved the space for that. And then uh, we have a hot meeting on Thursday. Uh, I had one issue coming development tools in the meeting, and I was going to print copies of the paperwork that Stephanie gave me, but I drove a different car this morning, and that one's laying on the street. So I will bring that next week. You have my apologies. We had a uh, great day at the landfill last week watching the, the demonstration of the shredder uh, that uh, Vermeer had brought up. I was, I thought it was going to be much more. Uh, a lot louder and a lot more involved, but it really just quite handily took care of the trash they were dumping in. Um, it reduced the volume by 50% or more. Yeah. It was pretty impressive. Premier, I asked, I ran into TJ and asked him about it this morning because I knew it was happening at Goodman 10. <laughs> he said, Premier believes it's 80%, and yeah. his opinion is it's, it's a 70% reduction. I think they were very careful to say 50 just to protect themselves a little bit, but yeah, it could be just a lot the, more. The pile of stuff that comes out is probably a 50% reduction, but then it compacts a lot better. So yeah. when it's all said and done, yeah. um, it's that it's a million bucks to get into it at least. He said, as we'll it's one year, it's less than one year payoff. Yeah, you look at what, how it extend the life of the landfill and what the cost of closing and opening the landfill would be. It's amazing. So I, I'll send you all photos and videos as soon as I can reduce them down so I can send them to you in an email. And they'll be available on my Vermace District 3 uh, Facebook page as well as soon as I can get them reduced. It was an incredibly windy day out there, but in spite of that, I, they had some barriers up. And it was amazing. So. All right. 
Next on the agenda, 1015, consideration of comments from the previous meeting public hearing and consideration of the bids that were opened at the previous meeting for possible action on the sale of land in the future. I scanned an email, both bids to you. I sent out the map of the ABCD if anyone needed that. The appraisal report. I have those floodway fringe uh, restrictions. restrictions if anyone needs to reference that. Could I just look at that table sometimes? Maybe that. I'm going to read part one of section 331.301 again. General powers and duties of supervisor states a county may, except as expressly limited by the Constitution of the United States of Iowa, and if not inconsistent with the laws of the General Assembly, exercise any power and perform any function it deems appropriate to protect and preserve the rights, privileges, and property of the county or of its residents, and to preserve, preserve and improve the peace, safety, health, welfare, comfort, and convenience of its residents. So as we go into this discussion, I'd like us to keep that at the forefront. This appraisal, it was only on the 4.5 acre section, not the entire deal. Yeah. And at that 4.5 or $35,000 an acre, it was 157500 So just to keep that in mind, the high bid was 177 and bid 450 Yes. Now, if we sell that, what are the costs we have to repay the DNR? Seven hundred fifty bucks. Is that what it was? Something like that. I don't know. Pretty minimal. And also, it'd be the loss of seed harvest that's going to be on that. We're not going to have harvesting off that. We don't harvest seed. That ain't the harvest seed off. The potential. Well, the potential is there. No, no. That's not. That's a wildlife refuge. That's what the cost we did with the DNR was for a wildlife refuge. That's what it states in their contract. It's not for harvesting seed. It's for a wildlife refuge. That's what they donated their seed for. Okay. The harvesting the seed was over by the medical first or second last year. By the training facility, correct? Yeah. yeah. They're when they're stripping their the driveway uh, at uh, Wellington. Wellington, Wellington yeah. also. I would so, like to go uh, ahead. I'd say if if we were to get the appraised price per acre for all seven plus acres, it'd be two hundred and what some thousand dollars. But in all reality, you have to realize that other than that four point five where the appraisal was done, the others is not land that's to be used for anything basically other than the waterway. But it's part of what they're being sold as. So if you were buying, I understand. If you were buying farmland, you'd go like, well, woods on it, there's not, but here's the price we're going to get free for it. Well, if, it's, if they would have appraised the whole acreage, 
that we're looking at, at 35,000 per acre. In light of the fact that we did hear from most um, of the people we heard from were from Freeport in this room twice and at a meeting in Freeport and keeping that in mind and the statute I read before that, I would like to move that we not accept either one of these bids and not sell this land in Freeport. We have a motion, is there a second? Based on, I mean, I think we was, I applaud us for coming to the point of putting restrictions to a certain extent on the property. Um, but I just wish we could have come to a point where if we we're gonna sell it, it would have been only raised. That is still not brought up to flood point restrictions, but that above it. I think that would have been a great compromise and I think that would have satisfied most people as to our intentions and not let the way it is now could probably put apply for, put fill in, could put a parts of it could have a driveway, a parking lot, whatever. I mean, I think the intent was we weren't even here thinking about selling until somebody said, I want to put a solar field in. Well, that's what we should have. Obviously, it looks like maybe several people want to put a solar field in, but I don't know. Um, so I guess I would second her motion to not sell it since we couldn't come to what would have been an agreeable consensus, I think, for the public and probably the buyers with that. All right, we have a motion and a second to not take any action on the sale of the land in Freeport. Is there any further discussion? Yeah, one, one thing I want to remember, Mark, is that the DNR has the ultimate control over what can or cannot be done because of their review determining whether it's flood plain, flood fringe, or the impact of it, or the impact on, on the waterway. So it's far, that's far different than above what we would even look at. Tony Phillips has told us that the review, he simply rubber stamps it through and sends it to the DNR. That nothing, that really it's pretty much out of our control. Well, but what is out of our control is to have said, raised pedestal only, that's all you can do on this property. Um, that way it puts it above leaving you up to chance. You look at what happens with PFOs, you look at other things that the DNR approves that aren't probably what we would agree to do with our intent of how we want to protect our land. Is there any other further discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, the same sign. Aye. Motion fails. We just say aye. Yes. <laughs> you should decide to proceed with the sale. Here is the resolution in here. Do we have to fill in the dollar amount in the buyer's name? So choose to uh, go forward with the passing of this. Just let it be known that the restricted covenants on all properties will be permanent and will run with the land. They still allow a lot of options, and we know that. You know, we've held two public hearings on this. And at those public hearings, 
it was a ratio of approximately 400 plus voices to three to not sell this land. What's the point of a public hearing if you just ignore the neighbors in the neighborhood where this affects their livelihood and their property? That just doesn't make sense. Well, as a, on a different note, as a property owner out in the country, there were chicken buildings going to be built real close to me. Very nervous about it. In the end, nothing I could do about it. I went to meetings, showed that I wasn't for it, but they happened. And then if you wonder them, I don't even know they're there. <clears throat> I can guarantee you that if there are structures put in here that change the floodwaters, they will know they're there in the next flood. And yes, structures can be put in there under this ordinance. As long as the bottom level is one foot above the floodplain, and if there's a basement, they just have to allow for water to flow through that basement freely. The amount of buildable land there is pretty small. The remaining parcel is the primary parcel and still has uh, much more economic value than that and could be developed accordingly, be a lot of needs. Uh, the 400 to 2 number, I understand that, surely because I've had a lot of people in my district that have contacted me and said that they were they saw no objection to this. They understood that they're on the record. I'm sorry. They understood, is it on the record? These are conversations that people in my district had with me. That's There's the no record. Of that. That's fine. I understand what you're saying, Shirley, but let me finish. These people told me repeatedly, as, as any property owner, they bought their property knowing what they were dealing with. If they were an area that was in flood prone area like Fort or like Spillville, or even one little piece of, one little piece of uh, Calmer, that's designated as flood prone. They understand the property that they're buying and they take those risks as a property owner. And the bigger issue here is not necessarily what drains down from that dry, from that dry stream, bigger issue in, in there that's gotta be mitigated just like it was at some point here in Decorah. There may be a let, time and a levy has to go in down there to protect that, protect that property because the backwater is always an issue when the river gets high, that comes back up into Freeport. The issue that perhaps the issue from the sewer that back up into people's basements is uh, mitigated by the city sewer system. That I don't have any idea. But when people had diapers and sewage coming into their basement in previous floods, that came from another source. It did not come out of the dry run. And I don't imagine that anything inside of that dry run drainage channel is gonna be changed to any degree I've had a homeowner that lives right there that told me he thought that the best thing that could happen was the far end of it should be straightened out so that it doesn't retain, so the water goes through more quickly. And he experienced, he was in what's marked as a flood fringe area on his property. I asked him to write a letter. He wasn't willing to write a, an email to communicate. He told me what his feelings were, that he was not flooded. Uh, when the waters hit in either of those floods did not even have water up into his land, although it shows on the flood map as being hatched, as being in the flood fringe area. He had no problem if, unless the waters got significantly higher and crossed the road over towards the trader park, none of those people were involved in the previous issues according to what he related. So those are the co or comments that I received from a lot of folks that are out in their, in their areas. That's their general feeling. There's a record on the record comments from Spillville mm -hmm. against this land sale. Yes. Let me finish. And there's over 400 signatures on a petition and nearly 50 emails all saying don't sell this land on the record. Yeah. Not, not I had a conversation with somebody. No, They're I on the record. And I had a conversation with him also. He is, uh, his name is Paul Wormer. He sent me in that same message and I responded to him this way. As he responded as we the people is far more than to Paul. I have heard from many more people in this district and even some living at Freeport that have no objection to the sale. 
They chose not to email. They even live in areas in or near flooding. They say they knew what they were buying when they bought their property. They're not expecting the county to make the special accommodations for them. The impact on Freeport by this small parcel was negligible. The real issue is still the upper Iowa backwater and the city sewer that backs up into their basements with the flood water. So that's the response that I gave to Paul because I see him as my neighbor and serve with him on the city council and still will also. Yeah, I saw that response. Um, it's a little bit condescending of us to say to people, don't buy or you're going to flood, because most of these people were there before this all came about. A lot of them were there before the industrial park was put in the middle of their village, and they were against it at that time. So don't tell people, don't buy where you might flood. They were already there. Many of these people were already there. So you're telling me, surely, that it's, that other than 2008 and, and 16, that river never flooded in those areas? It's flooding more now. Yeah. We never had water up in the cul-de-sac of, what is it, K, K Avenue, the cul-de-sac and the other one. There was never water there before. That's new. Their flooding is more significant now. And 16 was, was a above, what, a 100-year flood or a 500-year flood? I also would call in to mention that, you know, um, here again, documentation is so important. And that one of the neighbors has said, you know, he was going down there, promised this would be left as a buffer zone between the, because it really isn't a desirable building spot as one might want. Thought it'll be left as a buffer zone, never be developed. And here are, here we are. And we have no documentation on that. No, we don't. Just like we don't have documentation on lots of hearsay. So um, I think it's a lesson to us that we need to make sure everything is documented. And I'm glad at least in the sale proposal, it's put in for perpetuity that, that those restrictions as weak as they might be or strong are there. But it's, it's a different world we live in today, I guess. But maybe I would, not so different. Yeah, keep going back <laughs> and I will keep beating the dead horse that's the big elephant in the room. The majority, significant majority of the people we've heard from, documented, heard from, do not want us to sell this. Most of the people around this area in Freeport have contacted us. Not one, we might have a chicken farm in their backyard. Most of the people in the neighborhood of Freeport have contacted us. There was a lot more people that were on that issue, surely. I was just using it as an example. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to excuse me. And I think that it's on record that when Walmart Built, you know, they were found liable of filling in the floodplain and creating, changing the flow of water and flooding and how it affects everything. Here's another uh, example of what potentially will happen. Uh, even more change. I disagree with that. I mean, Walmart, Walmart hauled in a lot of fill. They've caused more flooding issues for Freeport than you could ever even think of by selling this land. You just made my point, though. People can put fill in here. If it's approved by the DNR. Approved by the DNR. DNR could very well approve that. It still fits in the flood fringe district ram, uh, issue. So you just no made control. my point. I have no control as, a, as an elected official over the DNR. We have Any control over the this. Action. We have control over this land. And this land belongs to the taxpayers of Winnesha County, many of whom are sitting here, 450 of whom you you were contacted by. They own this land. We don't own it. The whole county owns it. We've got three just, against on record. And just like the property that we disposed of in Spillville that was owned by the county and we didn't have a use for that we disposed of, those people knew that it was flood prone and subject to flooding by the, the Turkey River and there was no objections by anybody that in that sale. We didn't have them coming in saying, please don't sell it, did we? Nobody said that. Nobody. Right now, we have a lot of people who have contacted us, and we're choosing to ignore the people. And we may have other pieces of county-owned property that we don't have a use for that we probably shouldn't own and should be in the in the private sector side. But we'll handle those one by one and very carefully with public hearings. This is a public hearing. Well, I think we've discussed this. I guess my, I, I'm for selling it, but uh, Trace, I, 
not have the experience. That's where I, I, I think so. I mean, it's like I said, if you buy something, you have to pay for everything. If that's what you want. And I think the assessed value I was putting my two cents worth. Yeah. Okay. Just clarify that, would you? I would say. I wouldn't say a dollar. No, well, but I just didn't know you say anything. Yep. Andy walked in at the perfect yep. time. So I will ask you this question, yeah. Andy. If we, as a board, decided that the bid of 177450 was not as much as we want for the land, what would our next step be? If we still thought we could get more for it? Reject the bids and start over. Which would just ask for new bids we wouldn't be another public can you put a you'd have another public hearing and go through the process you would you know that opens up the opportunity i'm glad you brought this up that we can start over again and go back to that resolution and put in pedestal construction only and move forward from there that's what we're talking about can we put a dollar amount in and say here's you know you can you can put a dollar on top now here's what it is you can put a minimum in there. minimum in there that's what I wish we'd have did the first go around. I mean, that's just my opinion. What was the appraisal? Right. What was the appraisal? Thirty-five thousand for that four point four point five acres. Yeah. We're a total of one fifty-seven five hundred on that four point five. If it all came in, but if you take four point, that was that's, that parcel was four five hundred seven. So. That one was four. The appraisal showed four point on the maps. It shows so approximately. I think Justice Riley is. Is that four point five nine? I think or four point six nine. Four point six nine acres each. All of these maps have a little bit different on that, and I don't know if it's because we changed that right away. We kept that from the original mapping of it to what it is now. A part of it is not that nothing is official on this map because it. The, the sale requires them to Survey. get it surveyed and plat the actual division of that parcel. So then it will become an official line. Right now we're just guessing based on that. Because one has 4.02 and there's uh, 4.68. So, which, but nonetheless, I think the total price is not, I mean, it is what it is. We know it. As Mark said, when we started this process, we knew what land was worth in Freeport because of the current sale out there. So, it, but I would agree with Shirley, go back, restart, raise pedestal only, which I think would satisfy the most of the people, not all, but I mean, we're going to have to say if we want to sell it. I'd like to work with that. One thing maybe to look at is the dollar discrepancy between the two bids, too. You know, if you think you're going to get more, that may be for everybody to stock out at the two. I guess we could put a price out there if nobody wants it. I don't know. Sense worth, I guess. That's where I'm at. If that were the case, then what do you think is a minimum, a minimum bid amount that may be? Uh, can we can't discuss that here now, can we? Or not? Or it's got to be at the close. Or? Well, you can, uh, if you're going to rebid it, if you're going to open it up again, you're going to need to discuss it. Yes, sir. Yeah. I think we know we have what the minimum should be able to see what the appraisal was on that land and that, that land was appraised less than what the other sale was if I remember right in Freeport so already a bargain price about 30 cents can we say a dollar amount yeah. I, mean, I don't want to get I mean I think you yeah. get bid, bids in front of you if you're going to reject them and Set a minimum amount, you're going to have to decide what the minimum yeah. amount is, and that's public. Uh, I would say 
250 is where I was at. That's the figure I had in my mind. I think we first need to move to reject these bids and start the process over again. Which I, I don't, whatever, that's, that's my opinion. I'm one person. I, do you have a figure in your mind, Mr. Chairman? I don't. I guess I wasn't really prepared for this. I had what I had in the back of my head the whole way. I think it sounds so. Get that. I mean, it's, yeah. Obviously, we didn't want to sell the land. If we can just put in trace pedestal only, no parking lots, drivers, whatever, you know, you just make it satisfy the most people's. There's a motion on the table. There is. There is. I motion that we reject these bids and start the process over. You hear that? I'll second that. Give me and now you've got a second. We have a motion and a second to reject the bids and start over. Is there any further discussion? Make a suggestion. Perhaps you want to split that. You may want a motion to reject the bid and, and then, then have your discussion on the starting over because it seems to me yeah. you've got a couple different views of what starting over means here. I rescind my motion and I'll re motion to reject the two bids today. I'll second that. The rescinded motions and the motion on the table is to reject the bids today. Is there any further discussion? If none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Nay. Aye. So is this an item we want to put on the uh, agenda for next week? I I would like to see it on the agenda myself. Second. All right. Yep. We we'll put it on the agenda for next week. <coughs> oh yeah, we're a little behind. Next on the agenda, uh, continuation of the discussion regarding the public health topic. From the Mark Fork agenda. Yeah, she's coming. Morning, Kristen. Good morning. He was the one that asked to yeah. have this on here. So Krista was going to get back to us with issues about public health, what we are doing and not, so that we have some better information to be able to inform the public as to our budgeting versus surrounding counties budgeting. Um, so I took a look at the different programs that we offer and the different funding sources that exist for them. Um, and then also took a look at what's required by State of Iowa code. So the programs and the services that we offer in public health include emergency preparedness, all of the communicable disease investigations, which would mean uh, the TB or tuberculosis testing and follow up, the sexually transmitted infections, uh, testing, uh, disease management with that follow up. Um, as well as the other diseases. Uh, so the big one, of course, that we hear about in the country is measles. And uh, it is not a matter of if, it will be when it comes to Iowa. Um, but this would include other diseases such as like salmonella, E. coli. We are required to go ahead and, and investigate those. And each of those diseases, it depends on how long it takes to investigate them. Sometimes you get somebody who's um, very cooperative and it doesn't take as long. And sometimes people have a lot of places that they've been, and so you need to include all of that information. Um, we also provide immunizations for both children and adults. Uh, we work with the foot clinic program. We have a loan closet program. We offer radon test kits for sale. We do lots of education and teaching 
Uh, we also provide school nursing for the non-public schools in the county, uh, which means that we're assisting in doing the screenings for those children, such as vision screening, um, their height, weight, blood pressure, and doing scoliosis screenings. And we also partner with Luther College for um, clinical opportunities for public health, and um, they also do some home health stuff with us too. So that's the public health programming that we do. What's required for public health in Iowa by code is to impose and enforce quarantine and isolation, furnish supplies and services and the care during quarantine and isolation, communicable disease investigation and follow-up. This includes the insurance of STD, STI examination and treatment, immunization and dental audits for schools, immunization audits for child care centers, immunizations to children not provided elsewhere, assurance of enforcement of animal controlled infectious and contagious diseases, such as rabies investigation and quarantine, private sewage disposal systems in the time of transfer inspections, and assure completion of a community health assessment. What chapter in Iowa code does that apply? Oh, there's several chapters <laughs> where yeah. things are, are all out there, okay? Um, when it talks about funding, just want to share with you that for the local public health services contract, that is all formula funded. So the grants that we receive for immunizations for local public health to do all these things is formula funded. We don't get to say we want $75,000 to do this. This is how much you get. So 18% um, of the total local public health service funds are used in each county. So they take a general pot, say 18% of that is for each county. 8% of the total funds are allocated to each county according to the county's population. 44% of the total funds should be allocated and according to the proportion of state residents who are elderly. I don't know what they define as elderly living in a county. And 30% of those funds are allocated based on residents who are low income people living in the county. So that's with local public health. Our local public health services contract that we receive is 55,000 and change. So not a whole lot of money, but it is a nice sum of money to be able to do some public health program. Certainly doesn't pay any wages, right? Because we, we have to track our time and we bill our time to all of those services. So just realize that like you found out, no two counties are alike, okay? We're all different. Okay. There's 99 counties. We're all different. The green counties are county-based agencies. The gray counties are those who are hospital-based, right? Um, the hospital, sorry, the hospital-based uh, counties, they've maybe been that way for a long time. I do know of a county, let's see if they're on there. Um, they actually kicked their public health out. They kicked it out of the hospital, okay? They don't want it because it costs too much money. So that was a surprise um, because that has just happened and that's not reflected on that map, unfortunately. Um, the funding for public health falls under county taxes, uh, the different state grants and federal grants, certainly Medicare or Medicaid. Uh, there's some private insurances. There might be some private grant opportunities, donations and fees for service. So again, keep in mind that when we have grant billing, we can't just go out and submit a bill to somebody and say, I'm sorry, it took me 45 minutes to talk with you about your salmonella case. So now I have to send you my bill. You can't do that. We're able to bill that to the local public health grant. Um, you know, boards of health, they actually govern public health agencies. And so uh, chapter 137 actually defines their rules um, as far as what their powers and their duties are um, and of course, boards of health have jurisdiction over all public health matters in the county. Okay. Local boards of health have a lot of responsibility. It's more than just showing up at a meeting. All right. And people think it is just showing up at a meeting. There's a lot more involved. And so we follow, call it the 10 essential services of public health. Um, and so it's a nice little wheel, but it talks about 
assessment, monitoring, investigating, communicating to people, um, strengthening our workforce, championing, championing policies, uh, making sure that there's some equitable access to services, and of course, making sure that we're trying to be innovative and trying to improve the public health services in the county, in the state. And uh, this is a nice example. I, I really like this example um, because people like to interchange the terms equality and equity all the time. And they are completely different animals. If we wanna make sure that people are equal, we're all going to give them a bicycle, regardless of what their ability might be. When you take a look at equity, you're going to give people the right bicycle for their right capacity, what they can do, right? We're not gonna put a two-year-old on an adult bike, right? Um, so that's just a nice thing to be able to uh, share with people the difference between equity and equality. So, um, you know, boards of supervisors, they are limited in what they can do to public health. They do get to appoint board of health members. They do get to adopt the rules and regulations that the board of health approves. Uh, one of the most common ones that we can think of is when we did the smoking issue. That was a number of years ago, but that was a big deal. And then, of course, to appropriate county tax funds for the Board of Health approval. So um, when you take a look at the counties surrounding us that are hospital-based, so uh, like Albuquerque, Howard County, when you take a look at them, <clears throat> um, yes, they're receiving less than county tax dollars from their supervisors. But again, like I said before, the hospitals are paying way more money. They're paying the wages for all of those staff. They're paying the health insurance. And the, that money is not um, enough to really take care of the entire agency. They're also doing a lot more home care. So public health, because there's no money in public health, they do home care to help keep the lights on. We have a workforce problem in the country, all right? There's not enough people to be working. Uh, Wenatchee County has the highest um, population of people over the age of 80 in the state of Iowa. Okay. Now we could say that that's great or we could say that's bad. Right. First of all, it's great that people want to come here to retire. It's a good place. It's also a great place for people to tour. We've got some young families that come in because we've got some pretty darn good schools. Right. But we don't have a big draw for employers. Okay. Um, certainly because we have all of these older people they all need home care. They all need services. Just last week, I had four referrals. I can't take them because I don't have staff that can provide those services. That is mandated to be um, by Medicare or the CMS federal government that says, if you don't have staff, don't accept them. So I've got clients. I've got clients that need services. Today, I've got three calls already. Guess what? I can't take them. It's a workforce problem. There is not one entity around that can service everybody because they all have differing needs. So this is that equity part, making sure that we're providing the services that people do need. And so in the home care aspect, we have young people all the way up to seniors um, and everybody in between who might need skilled nursing services. Uh, that would include setting up the medications, perhaps in a, in a med dispenser. Um, it will include people who need assistance with a shower because it's a safety issue for them to get in and out of the shower by themselves. Maybe these are people who live in, say, like a group home, like Opportunity Homes or Mosaic. They have staff, but those staff have different duties than to provide personal cares on a regular basis for these folks. Uh, and then, of course, we have homemaker services. That's a service not provided by anybody. Um, so those are people who maybe they don't have the capacity or even the capability to stand at the sink and wash their dishes. But if they sit in the chair, somebody can wash the dishes and hand them to them to be dry. So they still feel like they're useful in taking care of their home. So there's a difference. There's different payers for those. Um, there's Medicare, there's private pay, there's VA. Uh, and then, of course, there's the MCOs. The only uh, thing that we have any control over for the pay of that, and even then you can say we don't have control over it, 
is our private pay people. Private pay is based on a sliding fee scale and we have to take a look at what their income is. There's a lot of people with an income less than $1,000 a month. That's hard to live on. <laughs> yeah. Um, and the rates that we get reimbursed from uh, the MCOs, managed care organizations, or the, the old Title 19s, and the VA, those are set rates that we just receive those dollars for. Of course, you have to do the service to receive the money. So, um, yeah. I don't know what else you want. Um, I do know that um, when I shared with my staff that there were concerns, they got really scared. They were really scared. How much duplication of services do we have? There isn't duplication. Well, I, what about, you You know, you were explaining to us the last time you were here about the STD trip testing that you do at Luther. Luther has a contract with with Winnesheek Men, and they also do the same testing. But yet we're, your, your concern was the privacy issue. Isn't that well covered already by HIPAA regulations and so forth? So Luther has a contract with WinMed for health services, yes. They send their students down to us for STD testing. We've actually heard it from those nurses. They would rather come to us. They don't want it showing up on their college bill. The STD testing isn't just for college students. It is for the high school students. It's for the middle school students. It's for anybody here. We want to keep that confidential, of course. Then we also have the medications that are free. Okay, again, that doesn't go through insurance so that it stays that much more confidential. So there is not the duplication of services that you're thinking. When they have a, they have an RN and they have a clerical person that staffs in their contract for Luther College. And so we, we don't have a duplication of services, but yet we're, we are choosing, you know, for their confidentiality, which I'm believing is still HIPAA, HIPAA regulations apply to them the same as it does us. And, and you're telling me that WinMed does not do the STD testing. They send them down to us. We get college students that come to us. Okay. That is also billed under the local public health service contract. That is not just we're here to offer it. We're able to bill our time under that contract. So you're telling me that when we look at the other counties, that have a relationship with their hospital and we average those out where Ben got the information from the local from the auditors of those four counties that use their hospital and we have a difference of what we have budgeted and our budget of six hundred thousand dollars over the average of those other four counties uh, how do I explain to the people that ask me within the district that I represent of how come our costs are four times Three, three to four times what those counties are. How do we, how do we, how do we answer that, Krista? We actually provide more public health services than those other entities do. We are also a larger county. We have two colleges in this county. And when I talk with some of my colleagues, they say the money that you're getting isn't nearly enough because we are a gap filler. We provide a gap for people who. Um, they're not ready for the nursing home. By the way, there's not enough workers in the nursing home either. Oh, nursing homes are shutting. Right, nursing homes are closing. This this isn't really about public health. This is about home care. They're doing more home care, and we have. They don't even have enough people to do the home care. So once again, thinking that to shuttle something maybe to the hospital, that's not the answer. They can't provide the services. They're going to need help too. They have open positions as well. So the Board of Health, is the Board of Health following up to see if there is an opportunity that would be beneficial for the for a relationship to be expanded with WinMed or not? The Board of Health is doing their own investigation in contacting counties to determine what are the revenue streams there are. And technically, when I've looked at things already and, and the phone calls that I've made, they've got the same revenue streams that what we have. 
the immunization grant, the local public health grant, and the emergency preparedness grant. $55,000 you spoke of. They all have different amounts. Yeah, I understand Some that. Some of them have less than what we have. How much, what's our, how much has our public health budget increased for the public to know in, let's say, the last four years? Ben, you have a rough idea yeah, what that might be? I don't know how it's going to be. No. Just put me on the spot. I have yeah. no reason to that. What? You know, the, the hospital has their own tax portion. And so when you look at these numbers, I'd like to see or like to know what those other counties pay in their what's the hospital charging for that additional work too. And I'm thinking what I'm hearing from Krista is those numbers might skew this a little bit, but also as a community, do we want to reduce services to the most vulnerable people in our county? That's a question we need to grapple with. And, and just speaking for myself, I'd rather not see reduction of services. I think that as a county, we do care and that we do care about our community. So I want to keep that on the front burner in this discussion. And our staff very much cares for the clients. They really wonder if something happens, what's going to happen to the clients? Do they matter to anybody? I think they matter. That's I don't see that as the issue. I see the issue that the legislature does not want to give us the funding necessary to meet every need that comes across our board. And when we look at something that we have to justify or explain to the citizenry, you've you've painted a very big picture over the top of this. And I haven't seen one thing that gives anything factual yet to be able to explain to the people or even explain to our newspaper friends who are right here that would like to all, perhaps they would also like to be able to educate the people. You know, I don't want duplication of services. I'm not as concerned when there's HIPAA laws that will protect the student so that it doesn't show up on their college bill. That's between them and their parents. That's a that's a moral issue that they've got to deal with. It's not my business, but I don't want to take and provide duplication of services. If there's things that we're not doing when we're having to take and worry, take care of the issues and cut funding and limit wage growth for all of our own county employees and the services that we have to provide, I want to see those services be able to reach all our people. I'm the oldest person sitting at this table. Am I concerned about what happens with healthcare? Certainly I am. But that is not, that's not the overarching principle that affects every of the 20,000 people that live in this county. Mm-hmm. We have a bigger, we have a whole problem. And I'm not seeing any answers yet from you that allows me to give something factual or some reason why we are so much better and why we're able to spend so much more money than they do for the services. I think what we've also heard from Krista is that the Board of Health is doing their own yes. investigating on this. So we're still in the beginning stages of this conversation. Right. And there's a lot more information to gather. That's exactly what I was just going yeah. to say. Good. We agree. <laughs> Can I ask a question about the Board of Health? Are they uh, salaried at all? And who is the chair of the board now? The Board of Health is not salaried. They're volunteer. The chairman of the Board of Health is Jay Ellsberg, who is a Jay Ellsberg. <clears throat> he is a veterinarian. Veterinarian. I say. We got a veterinarian. We got somebody at Luton College. We got Gunderson. We have a physician who is uh, representing a lot of the medical needs. We got school principal, superintendent. or superintendent, I mean, and then. And who's the rest? Okay. So we got all our bases covered. We got Animal, Public Well, yeah, Gunderson, Luther, Schools. Yeah. Ben, on our website, there's a link to all the boards and commissions, correct? Yes. It's, it's tricky to find, but it is on the website too, where you can see who serves on each board and commission for the county. It's actually in that book. I put Thank you. Great. <laughs> Great. And where I, where we're at is we're not looking to do anything overnight, but we know what we have coming forward for a budget next year. And we have to look at places where we can take and make some savings. And I think we, have to look at every option that we have. Um, and I, I see Steve's concern with 
you know, are we doubling up on this on that? And that would be an easy way to take a cost savings, but if we're not, I don't know exactly where we're going to head from here. But I, I we're just trying to prepare so when it rolls around next year that we know where we want to go. Uh, to sit and say that, well, first of all, uh, you can't, community members cannot go up to Luther and receive testing, all right? No. So that is not a beautification service. That's correct. And I, I think in regards to a lot of the things, there will be definitely a lot of holes. Right. If somebody, if the government or Medicare, Medicaid, insurance isn't going to pay for it, it's not going to happen. Right. Where that's where we're here to fill those gaps. And I know making it accessible for communicable diseases is important because if it's not available, people aren't going to do it and it's going to turn into a bigger mess. And oh, because I think we were in, just in that example of STD testing, we were all young ones. <laughs> And so we got to stop measles, same thing. It's like we need to stay on top of all of those things. But so the easy answer is is, is there a hybrid option? Maybe I don't know, but you know, the so, easy answer yeah. is that we need more staff so that we can actually take those home health referrals so that we can be paid revenue from Medicare, <clears throat> from VA, from the MCOs that adjust the shortfall. But that that's will, what it amounts to. It's that not public health. That's home care. That will cover the expenditure for that? It helps to balance that out. It doesn't cover it completely. It helps to balance it out. Makes a lot of sense. Keith uh, had mentioned things that we do. Mm -hmm. uh, on the things that we do, do we bill for those services to entities? One, I you mentioned the non-public schools. We provide the nurse. We don't. We're the board is talking about that. But keep in mind that with our partnership with Luther College, they provide us basically a lot of free services, a lot of free care because it's part of their training. And um, so that is actually a really nicety to have yeah. because it doesn't happen in other counties. But they don't have that partnership. They don't they don't get that opportunity for the training. But that would be like in, in regard to K-12. We provide this services in those schools K eight yeah K eight without charging they've got taxpayer money they have they do they have and that's it. something that the board is looking at yeah, and I think that's only fair to let the board look at it yeah work I, I don't know how long it's going to take them to do their study but there's numerous things we could look at that might help some mm -hmm. well I'm sorry your staff is feeling that way. They're terrified. Have to thank you. Thank you. Hopefully we can come to some sort of <laughs> compromise here and figure out where we're coming. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Next item on the agenda. Andy Vandermountain, County Attorney. Legal questions regarding agenda and other issues. Good morning, Andy. Good morning. Thanks for being patient. Good morning. Always vacation. <laughs> um, there's a stack on my desk back right there that uh, tells me vacation was pretty good. I think you're get that. <laughs> what do you have for me? I sent an email last week with Andy and your instructions to have him work with John Lukey to negotiate with the CTI on what kind of payments would be a reduction in the payment that we originally contracted for because we didn't feel like we got all of the outcomes we were contracting. Are we keeping all of the equipment? The idea is that we would keep this and we would work with a different company to help resolve our ongoing issues. So that's where we're at right now. And because this equipment seems to help with the online portion, it just doesn't address the in-house portion. So or didn't feel like they've gotten everything they've asked for, but 
they keep sending us a bill and asking us when we're going to pay the rest. So we need to resolve that. Sure. Yeah, our point is we don't need to be paying 100% of that bill because we didn't get 100% of the product. But we'd like to negotiate it down. Which one of you is uh, going to tell me where to start those negotiations? <laughs> <laughs> we got about half what we asked for. I mean, uh, the initial response from the other vendor we're looking at, he thought the equipment price was relatively fair. So uh, it's whatever their labor, but it didn't produce the end results. That's for sure. Was that itemized on the invoice? It was very basic. I mean, it was. A, a big dollar amount for equipment, a dollar amount for in implement implementation services, which is their installation and so on. Um, I'll get to that in the stack and talk to John and try to put something together to send a CTI. Thank you. Alliant never did respond to fix the sidewalk. Out there where the cable came down off there and we had a trip hazard, they did remove the concrete. We still got we have gravel there now. They've never they've never finished it. It's a minor thing, but it's I pointed it out to one of the city council members the other day. He says, I think that was uh, I thought that ought to be our problem, the city sidewalk. So we took the twenty three out that had pulled up. Uh, uh, gravel back. So it's not a trip hazard. Um, well, it is a, a different trip hazard. Yeah. yeah but there's, uh, no, that was, I thought it was Zydgren. 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 I talked with him. We were standing there right by him. And uh, it might, maybe it is a city, maybe it is a city issue. <laughs> I have a quick question. Um, what would be our process to pull a position out of the matrix and come up with a salary on our own to make it a more marketable position for what we need? Is that a position that's not currently filled? Correct. I'd have to go back and take a look at what, I mean, when you did the matrix, you you included this as a position, you had it scored, you had it uh, job description. I suppose you could, I suppose you could decide as a board if it's, if it's a position that you fill as opposed to someone else, I mean, another elected official. Um, I, I caution you that it becomes a slippery slope. Um, our previous matrix, we had a number of employees outside of it. And um, one of the reasons we went back and redid it was to score it uh, and use it. So yeah, you, you certainly have the authority if it's an employee under your supervision. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll speak freely about it. It's when we're looking at IT positions for the county, we're up against the private sector paying a hundred thousand or more for the position they need for IT security analysis. And it, we're finding it very difficult to fill that position. Thank you. Right. We, we don't have an open position. Right? Yes, we, we do. Yes, we do. John Luke right. emailed us this morning oh, and he, oh. he just removed his name. And that might be in part for other reasons. So we can talk about that we maybe on the upcoming what? agenda. I think previously there were three applicants. The two were, they didn't feel qualified. And it had been open for. I'd like quite to a while. explore that a little bit, and maybe that can be on the agenda coming up for all of us to discuss. Yeah. The, the answer to your question is the process is you guys need to take it out of it, but that's. That would touch you so I think it's one that you want to give some thought to you before jumping into it. 
because with that comes the problem you might have a long line of people wanting to make decisions. Yeah, it's economics and maybe yeah. X. Mm -hmm. It's just something definitely we could discuss it. Some of the but same thing of just here too. If she can't go for the car, yeah. Start with the stop at the start. Get rid of. Okay. Anyone have anything <clears throat> else for Andy? Welcome yeah. back. Yeah. Yes. When's your next vacation? <laughs> Come on. Not soon enough. Not soon. <laughs> Thank you, Andy. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. I'd like the next thing. We don't have anything else for the meeting here. If we did consent, Mandy. Uh, we have a motion to adjourn. Second. We have a motion and a second for adjournment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Meeting is now adjourned. Does anyone want to take a quick break or do you want to move right on? Okay. Next. So we have to have, just so the public knows, we aren't actually leaving. We're just. I got to call another meeting to order. Yeah, we got to call another meeting to order with all present. The agenda, we will be holding a public meeting. This whole line of business is to set the public hearing. No, first we're well, going to have a public hearing. Proposed tax. On the proposed tax. tax. Uh, there we go. Motion to open the public hearing. Second. Motion to second to open the public hearing. Second. Motion to second to open the public hearing. All those in favor say aye. 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 I have handouts. Did you? Did I put these in your box? Yeah. One? Okay. Two or nine on open public hearing. Yes. Just for the record. Okay. I was going to say. Yes. So this is a procedural thing in the new property tax law. It says that the meeting to uh the, to hold the public hearing on the proposed property tax levy has to be a separate meeting so that's why we had to adjourn this regular one call to order a new meeting to discuss or to have this public hearing and we can't take any other action except to hold the public hearing in this meeting was there any questions comments from anyone i can Describe the handout here a little bit if you want. Um, the uh, the front page. I mean, this has the the real uh, meat of the discussion. Basically, is uh, proposed tax levies. So you can see the leftmost column are the proposed levies for next fiscal year, um, along with history for the last several years. Uh, so you can see where we've been. Um, the New property tax law, it ties your levy rate powers and limits to your valuation growth. So the second page shows your uh, valuations and for the last several years, as far as the taxable valuations and um, the, if your valuation growth is less than 3%, which ours is this year, and our limits are to use the same levy rate as last year for general the general fund and the rural fund. So on that front page, you can see that our general fund and rural fund levy rates are the same as they were last year. We are seeing an increase in our general supplemental fund. Um, the general supplemental fund is a fund that is not restricted in rate. It is restricted in what the funds can be used for what they can be used. So um, they have a very limited, basically, what you can uh, spend that money on. And uh, one of those expenses is 
emergency management which runs our dispatch center and so we have the 911 towers that we uh, have signed a contract to pay 900,000 a year for two more years yet after this fiscal year and um, that money is allowed to be paid out of the general supplemental fund and so that's 63 cents of the 93 cents we're increasing that rate just simply to make that payment Excellent. we'll just have one more after this after one this one nine hundred after this yeah. 20, yeah. 20, yeah. 26 yeah. budget we'll have one there and that'll be it yeah and then yeah. there will 25, be 25 26. then in the 27 budget there's going to be a remainder payment that covers the change orders and stuff that'll probably be a hundred thousand or less so so we um we made the nine hundred thousand dollar payment for the current year out of the general fund because we had money there to do it but with the purchase of the new building and increased cost of doing business we had to use that money to just keep the county running so we had to move that payment to the general supplemental fund we had to afford to continue to make that payment um, we've discussed this before um but making that payment it was basically basically a gracious offer by raycom who was the, the company that installed the towers that let, let us pay over time with no interest whereas many counties have had to bond borrow money to do their tower upgrades and so if you had if you had to go to a bond that's where this debt service levy you can see the fourth line down you could you could include a debt service levy but the 63 cents that you're raising general supplemental would not be enough if you have to pay interest and bonding expenses so it would actually cost more to do it as a bond than to just do it through the general supplemental levy so this is a way for us to save the taxpayers some money in the long run although it seems like a hit this year can you uh, actually mark might be able to remember the figures but we're getting our 9-11 towers for millions of dollars less than other parts of the state. Yeah. Because one, we are in bond with interest over time and because we got a better deal. Most of them are paying eight, 10 million and we're gonna have, put the other tower out there, probably 4 million total. Because we had, what, 3.2 here. And that tower out there was 700. We're gonna have roughly 4 million tied up in most counties are going to be eight to ten. That's just for their base cost. That's without interest. Interest. Yeah. And most of them haven't even gone down that road. Road. No. Now, so the prices are going to be even higher. Yeah. yeah. I mean, another year we're going to have our. That was that was one of our biggest advantages. Is like the one out on Highway Nine by the John Deere yeah. dealership. We got done before this got to be a big. And there was a lot of competition yeah. in the building of these and the. And we're able to spread it out that that one's getting paid a different way than the next yep. ones and so on. So, in the yeah, end, we got this. We locked this price in for you know, two years ago before you know we locked it in, and then it gave us interest free to yeah. pay it off. So it was a win-win by you know. Actually, really, I need to thank Raycom for the way they gave us the contract to pay through. Yeah. It'll work for them because we had four towers to put up so they could start, they could work around all four sites at one time and never have to leave the area. And it was just, uh, it was cheaper for them too. I mean, yeah, because your relocation costs are a lot, a lot of money. If you're all within the same county. You're just you can start put one tower or the other, you know, just rotate the equipment right in the general area rather than come up, do one and come back and have to, I mean, yeah, it just, way time saving and then the weather last summer was excellent for work so it was a win-win for them and us both that's the biggest chunk of our increases we had some increases in property insurance rates which are paid from the supplemental fund we have the new it employee that we don't have <laughs> that uh um is going to be funded through the emergency management department so that was an increase in that fund and then changed some other allowed things that were in the general fund to the supplemental fund i think we've gotten almost everything that can be legally moved from general to supplemental moved now um 
one of the biggest ones in the current or the new fiscal year is I put half of my salary and, the, and half of Lori and my office salary into the supplemental fund because election expenses are allowed in the supplemental fund. So considering that the, we're the two main ones that do elections in my office, we've moved parts of our salary into that, but there isn't much more we can move into the supplemental fund. So as we go forward with the this law holding us our ability to increase our levy down, that's where it comes up your discussion with public health is that, you know, if we have cost of doing business and salary raises and things going up four or five percent, but we can only in increase our revenue by one percent, then we got to cut something to make up the difference. So that's where we're looking for any place we can come up with savings. And the value of the dollar uh, in the current 24 money does not equate yeah. what the inflation rate is. We continue yeah. to go backwards. Yeah, that's what I mean. The cost of doing business, everything is more expensive now. And so yeah. here we are strapped with a law that's going to limit our ability to grow our property tax okay. revenue at the same time as we're seeing these increases. I mean, every department expressed increases in heating and electricity costs and in fuel costs and things that you have to have to continue to do to offer services. So and hopefully doing the spectrum building and getting rid of the Smith Smith building will save us some money in the could be a huge, be a huge cost dollar savings. You have something huge. Sure. Um, <clears throat> the roads as to uh, is, has there been any kind of a study on um, increases in road gravel costs in the, in the uh, you know, construction of the roads? I, I have seen many graphs of road revenues and most of the roads revenue is, is the part portion the board can put in is limited by the code. So they put the maximum they can fund roads in every year and that's limited. They can't put any more money in. The other big portion of roads funding comes from uh, the road use tax, which is fuel tax at the pump and your vehicle license fees that you pay annually. And so that gets divided up, goes into Des Moines, DOT takes out a share, then there's a formula for dividing that up for counties and cities. That increase in revenue is a very slight line that goes like this. Like 2017, they said was the last fuel tax. Increase. And so that line barely increases because we have only so much property value growth. We can't fund any more for property taxes and we aren't selling fuel. We aren't increasing the number of gallons because that's how a fuel tax works is by getting the gallons. Actually, in some instances, as cars become more uh, efficient people use fewer gallons of fuel, which means there's less money going into roads. So their revenue is very restricted. Whereas if you look at the price for a ton of rock, that you don't have to go back, I don't know, eight or ten years, and it's doubled since then. Yeah. So that that that's the other part of it. Yes. And um, that's what I'm kind of getting at is is there some kind of a, a way of studying the increases in the rock productions and so forth, but, but the uh, quality across the state. Are we are we in the middle or at the bottom or at the highest? There's a state, um, what do you want to call it? The level the rock has to meet for a state yep. level. Standard, minimum standard. standard. We got some of the best rock in the Northeast yeah. Iowa there is in the state. I mean, I there's counties know. probably southwest of Iowa that have them. Oh, they, they, they just, yeah, it's quality yeah. rock. I'm not stating that. That it, it's just that if it's doubled in just a few years, um, that's a really extraordinary amount of money that's coming out of the taxpayers' dollars. And then when you get to the the licensing and the weight loads, or uh, you know, that is that set by the county, or is that like a state and they add on something, or you know, it's all, it's all regulated by the state. The, uh, and those heavy weight city, aren't paying the same fuel. Cities have the ability to put farmers on, right? 
Cities have the ability to establish weight limits on roads permanently. So they can say like no truck traffic or no vehicles over a certain weight. The county does not have authority to do that except for 90 days a year for the embargo. Embar embar embargoes under <laughs> certain weather conditions. We can't say this road can't be used. Yeah, yeah, I can, I can understand. The most effective thing you can do as citizens right now is contact your state legislators. Okay. Because it, it's all coming from the state as far as our our hands are tied on some of this money for roads and bridges. So contact them, ask them to do no more unfunded mandates to the counties, ask them to increase fuel tax or make everybody pay it. Um, there's a lot of things they could do at the state to help the counties that they are doing right now, but be respectful when you do it. Right, yeah, I, I think uh, I, in my experience, uh, the heavier load in your truck, the more you have to pay for a license. Well, it seemed to be rather reasonable actually overall. And so if that was increased more, there would be more revenue that might come into the county. I think there's a lot of possible avenues where they could direct more money to the county. Uh, yeah. We go back 20, 25 years and we were, our five year road plan usually had one or two roads that we were going to pave that were currently gravel. Now we can't even maintain the ones, the ones we, we have. have. We we don't have enough money to pay, to keep the pavements we have not falling apart. There's no way we could even think about paving a new one at this point. About $50 million behind them just get caught up. Yeah. I, I, I feel like the, the heaviest users should pay a little more. But we will have to talk to the state. And some don't pay anything. <laughs> the uh, some that will pay anything. Now there are some, he said that there are some, some users that don't pay anything because right. agricultural fuel is fuel tax exempt. So and, right. you're not licensing grain carts and other things. I don't know if during a, the sale of that there's Oh, well, they own the license on their own semis. It's different. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, there's individuals that walk and they don't use a vehicle. But, you know, it, it, uh, anyway, thank you. Yeah, yep. We very briefly looked at the opportunity for us to even crush our own rock. And that's immediately <laughs> was determined to be a non-starter. You know, first of all, you would have a capital expenditure of at least $5 million to set it up. And, and then you would, if you didn't, if it wasn't successful, then you would jeopardize your relationship with your current providers. Which may cause more of an increase in the right. price. It, it, that is a definite non-starter. Yeah, the, the problem with Wenishik is there's only one provider, <laughs> primarily. Pretty much, that's pretty much wherever really you go. That's pretty much wherever you go. Yeah, it don't matter where you go. That's. The third page, uh, Michael, you want to go back or? A question. Um, are all 99 counties as far behind in their road budgeting and their five year plans as Winnishik? No. I think, I think it's typical, but I don't think all are. I mean, you have counties where the urban centers, so much of the roads are in city limits that the county doesn't have as many roads that they have to take care of. And especially then they get to have a larger property tax base. So there are counties, there's a minimum amount of the, of the uh, maximum transfer. So we do the maximum transfer we can to the road fund. And I think it's 75% that the county has to do at least 75% of that to be able to qualify for their full share of the road use tax fund. Um, I don't know if there are counties that don't at least do 75%. If there are, there's only one or two that have that. And it did have so much money, they don't know what to do with yeah, that. There's a, Some of the bridge funding goes to larger urban centers too, because they have larger bridges that can fall under that project. So they get a lot of that money. But we have the most bridges for any county yeah. in the state yeah. because we're in the Driftless. Listen. My observation is that's the big elephant in the room, oh. the roads. Yeah, yeah. It yeah. is. And, and the idea that the state is not providing the funds for that that huge. We can only put X many dollars of our yeah. budget to roads too. We're limited. Not are they not can't, uh, providing the funds. They're mandating other stuff that we have to pay for that they made law. Yeah. How much did you just spend in postage? Yeah. I, I don't have the bill yet, but it 
I have guessed 8,000. I've heard other counties are more like 12,000 to send them mailing. So, yes, this is another unfunded mandate. First amendment more than Christmas. Uh, Alvin, what did you say? You're going to raise a dollar for a thousand? 93 cents is the proposed increase. Okay. My house that I bought 15 years ago, for the last 10 years, I've gone up so high in the assessment value that I'm over 80 years old. I can live there until I die, but I don't think I'm going to be able to because you guys are raising adults. School's going to be building new elementary school here probably within the next year or two. Taxes are going to go up again. How can, how can guys that are over 80 years old to live if you guys keep raising taxes like that? I don't see how the hell I'm going to be able to do it. I'm paying over $4,000 a year now for my home. I could not afford to buy the home that I bought 15 years ago. That's what they've assessed value at. I'm not sort of for that. I don't intend on selling it, but it looks like I may have to. But if you guys are raising a dollar, I don't know what the city is going to do. Do you live within the city limits? Pardon? Do you live within the decor city limits? Okay. We we have nothing to do with the assessed value. That's by the state. The state, we we have nothing to do with the county's assessed value. We, we can't, we, we have nothing to do with the assessor's office. That all comes from the state. And that goes by the housing market is high so that's what they go off so what we, we can't control the housing market I mean, but you do base your, your dollar, dollar for assessed valuation how do you base that it's, but it's not on the one thing to keep in mind is that your taxes are not figured on your assessed value so they're figured on your taxable value so the state has a an I was going to mention here on this third page of this is the public hearing notice. There's an examples on there. They are poor examples because they don't take into consideration changes in a, uh, the rollback from assessed to taxable value and how that's going to affect people. So I put together uh, an example here. Um, this is actually my home. I have a a, a home, a shed, and 20 acres of land. The assessed value in the current fiscal year is 248,000 and change, but the taxable value is 139. Next year, my assessed value goes up to 284,000, but the taxable value actually goes down to 134,000. Yeah, so, I have no idea what mine is. I, what you're talking about is all. It's on here. It's all the tax. It's wonderful, but I don't understand. I I think most people, if if you don't have a major improvements to your home or some extraneous um, uh, something that I, that isn't the normal, most people will actually see a reduction in their taxable value for their homes next fiscal year. Who's going to show that my tax bill? Your tax bill will show that, yes. So the assessor is required to report the assessed value. And so you get that notice um, in this time of the year, but what they're sending you now doesn't affect your tax bill for a year and a half from now. That's how far long it takes for those changes in assessed value to take effect. The state takes all of the increases statewide, and then they use a formula to figure what is commonly called the rollback, but it's called an officially it's called an assessment limitation that says we're going to take your assessed value and we're going to lower it by a certain percentage to come up with your taxable value. Um, home values have gone up so much since the previous year's valuation that they made the rollback go down so much that uh, that's why ours are actually showing decreased taxable values for next fiscal year. Well, that, that's the same problem I had. It's other reason I had when I moved there. Yeah. It was open. I mean, yeah. was open houses. They built fantastic houses here, four or five hundred, six hundred thousand dollars houses. My taxes go up. Crazy. Yeah. The, uh, I have a question for you, sir. 
did you did you also apply for your senior? I did that when I first moved here. I was over 65 and I could do it. I think you I 15 years ago. I think you should re check to see if you need to reapply because okay. everybody got my senior that says that applies. Okay. So if you didn't physically go in and talk to them, there's two now there are now two homestead credit, two two types of homestead credit. So another one they just put in effect to your last yeah. last year. Yeah. You may want to check into that. Go to the assessor's office. The assessor's office on just go out here around to the left and come in immediately on the left. You'll see a sign for the assessor's office. He took me right in here right away from the building there deal and get right there. But, but I would no, uh, I, mean, I would is, check again there yeah, might be another one. On this new on the new law that passed, I think you may you may be eligible for that. Additional, additional homestead credit. I mean, I read something in the paper, but I thought I'd already done it, so I don't. Yeah, no. Two different. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I went in and filled out, you know, for my wife and I that same form, so I had to go in this year and do it. And there's also a veteran uh, potential for. There's veteran. also a veteran that increased veterans uh, exemption. Sir, cut off for that. Uh, you so, uh, there's a date for the state's got to be. July 1st to fill out the new application. So you people should go in so now. The office is open every day. It's the first floor of the courthouse on the left as you go in that main door. So if you're over 65 and you own a house and you haven't registered with them in the last year, that's still waiting for you. And it's, it's an amount this year and that amount increases next year. You guys make it, you guys make it too confusing. Yeah. <laughs> I will agree with you. I'll agree with you. Yeah. 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 That's why we're so glad we have Ben because we ask him questions all the time because it is confusing. You can't retire Ben. Yeah, and he's also accessible for questions for the public. Sorry to let people know that, but yeah. no, his office is there for those questions too. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's going to say no, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, I motion to close public hearing. Second. Is there more comment or anything online? Second. I don't see anything online, and I don't see any hands up. Okay, we have a motion and a second to close the public hearing. All those in favor, say aye. 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 We need a motion to accept the property. No, first we need to adjourn this meeting. Okay. I move to adjourn the meeting. I'll second. We have a motion and a second for adjournment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Now you can call the call open another meeting so we can set the public hearing. I motion to open a well, I got a I call the meeting to order with following amendments. The item we have is to uh set a public hearing for the year ending 25 proposed budget. So I uh I propose that's very resolution here to set that public hearing. I'm proposing you do it on April 22nd at 11 a.m. I move to accept the resolution as prepared. Second. I have a motion and second to set the public hearing for the year ending 25 proposed budget for April 22nd at 11 o'clock. Any further discussion? If not, it is a resolution. Shirley? Aye. Mark Bullock? Aye. Steve? Aye. Mark Frick? Aye. And I also. Resolution passes unanimously. Okay. Move to adjourn. I'll second that. Do we have a little bit of a second for adjournment again? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Uh, Everybody for attending. Anyone who would like a copy of this for your own purposes, I have. Put in the closet this week. Oh, yeah, I had. I just had these printed. The, the eight and a half by 11 we're going to hold on to, uh, but ready. there is this size, done by 17. There is this size, which is called a half sheet, and then the large one uh, will restrict the need for 
the only plan I have, but these are so original. You have extras in there. I have I have copies made for all of them. Okay. And there is two, there are two sheets of each one. Uh, one includes uh, just basic rooms, and the other one includes. Sounds like I haven't seen the email, but sounds like he sent out an email that says. No. I think one with the dimensions. With the dimensions. Yeah. That he withdrew his name from yeah. the okay. Yeah. Email names. Mm. Mark your, your size preference. Uh, so the meeting is still going on online. Okay. We're still talking here, so I don't think you should shut it off yet. Surely you can get one of these. Uh, and this one, so it doesn't have the dimensions, is be a little more convenient to. Okay. Okay. <laughs> well, so it'll be through email. Okay. Yeah. That's uh, that's the dimension. And then this one is easy to yeah. identify for rooms and things. Yeah. You do have extras of these too. I do, yes. I have. And we have, fortunately, for posterity, we have the electronic version on file, yes. which is available. You can see I had to, the reason I was late is I had to stop and assist a yeah. young lady who her car was in the ditch from the. Oh, no. So on my way into town, she had slid off the road and it was in the. You know where I live. You know, that doesn't give you much no. for sure, but it, it was in an area where there's no cell phone reception anywhere close. So I picked her up and took her back to the top of the hill and let her use my phone because she couldn't find her phone. It was somewhere in her car that she couldn't find it. And, you know, Good deal. Yeah, that's right. And so then she called into work and called her dad and everything. And then I had to take her back to her car because she was going to wait there for her dad to come and assist her. So anyway. And then it's like, I better not drive too fast because otherwise I'll be the next one in the ditch. <laughs> it was, the gravel roads were bad this morning. You see why like can't. suck you here, suck you there, like this. You can see by the elevator. Yeah, yeah. Get to the old stage road and the pavement was, you want to know I wasn't so the side. I mean, it was just a little damp from the rain. Gravel roads are large size. He said, this is supposed to be scary. Oh, why? Thank you. 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 That would put someplace where steel plant. The people well, can because this is this one we're going to really use for space plant. Right, I'm putting that yeah. my big one back, so I just put out of that pile. Okay. You want to take all the bigger? Yeah, you want big, just to have these. Well, those are better. I mean, you yeah, can yeah. have these. No, nope. I mean Beth can. Beth, I, Beth has the file. She printed oh, these two one. of this. There's two of each one. Oh, okay. One, one's dimensioned and one's not. Yep. That's and these, here. these allow us. Just for example. If you look at this right here, this is a big office. I've been watching just about enough basketball. Can we present this office right here? Yeah, right. So the, these two yeah, offices. Yeah, gotta just skip last year. I mean, yes, we're just going to make it past the third quarter. Is that what you say? I'll start all this again. This opens up this side over here. Who wasn't the paper? And we don't know if it's three or eight spectrum. Exactly. Well, maybe this. Uh, this room right here, this is not a room, but this one is solid. This could be, this is a 30, 30 foot room. This is a 30 foot and create a 12 by 20 foot office across this end for something to use. And then Toys Go, Toys Go Around has their own. This is the fun to watch because yeah. men did not do very well. Right yeah. 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 
Um, okay, I'm going to shut the, off the online meeting is, now. So it's, oh, this is there better. are not uh, more than three supervisors still talking business. Marketing. Marketing. <laughs> <laughs>